Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Seeds are expensive. If you want to avoid buying them next year, save some this year. Also, daffodils are one of the early heralds of spring. Today, we're going to look at the different varieties. That's just ahead of the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Dr. Lilia Kelly. Dr. Kelly is a retired horticulture professor, Mississippi, and Joella Diamond will be joining me later. Dr. Kelly, it's always good to have you here. Oh, yeah, it's always great fun. <laughs> uh, I love being fun. on this show. We always have such a big time. <laughs> yes, we do. We definitely do. And today we're going to talk about something that a lot of people are interested in. Oh, yeah. Seed saving. Yeah. Right? So what do yep. we need to start with that? Well, this is the time of year you do it, the okay. end of the growing right. season when plants are getting mature and setting their seeds and things. Okay. And first thing you could say, well, why do I want to do this? Yeah. You know, why do we need to save seeds? <laughs> well, obviously, like you mentioned, save some money. Save money. You know, right. because everything now is just so expensive yes, it and it's really easy to save seeds from our favorite plants. Okay. And then we can perpetuate our favorite plants. And you can save, like I said, you can save vegetable seed. Mm -hmm. You can save your annual seed from your flowers, your perennial seed. Some of them easier save than others, okay. and they come back quickly from seed. Uh, trees, yeah, I've germinated trees that I, are I really easy. Cool. You know, okay. like uh, buckeyes okay. are easy okay. to germinate. Okay. You know, and know going that. around in the see what going around getting acorns in the fall if you've got a, a white oak or a swamp right. chestnut or a nut or something. You know, it might oh, take good. a while, that's but good. you know, they're easy to germinate as well. So how do you collect seeds? That's the you big know, question. When do right. you do it? How well, and when? You know, seeds are come in different structures on a plant. Okay. And you first need to make sure whatever that structure is, whether it's a capsule or the fruit, or it's, it's mature. It okay. needs to be mature. A lot of seed will dry on the plant. Obviously, it's in a f fleshy fruit. That's not the case. So the best time to collect most seeds is in a sunny, dry day when whatever's containing the fruit, I mean the seed, is mature. Okay. Seed, so, so you can tell the difference whether it's immature or mature. Yeah, you so, can, okay. you know, right. and like I said, make sure, like, for example, you okay. want to collect tomato seed. Okay. All right. From, so make sure your tomato is good and ripe. You know, it could even be half rotten. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. You know, so, you know, that's for fruit. Right. It doesn't matter that it needs to be at the peak of maturity or on the downside. Got it. Got you it. don't want to get it green because okay. the seeds are not mature in that fruit Good. and they're not going to germinate. Good point. All now, right. some of the other, you know, like uh, flower heads of our, of our, like zinnias and marigolds and things, you know, you can tell when they're dry and crispy. Okay. Or if they're in a capsule, you know, they can, they can be uh, dry and crispy. And I've got some examples yeah, of things and I can show you that. Well, I have Texas Star Hibiscus, and they come within a capsule. So, see, you would have to break that open, and the seed will just fall out, mm, see? I see it. How about and that? And then the marigolds, you know, that's see, that's good and dry. So, you just pull that apart. Actually, the seed are these little black things, and you can just go overdo it with these marigolds. Look here, I got a, I got a pile of them. <laughs> But, uh, and then I defrosted my deep freeze, Chris, the other day. I made okay. so much garden produce, okay. I blew out the top of my deep freeze. So I dug it all out, and I found these strawberry popcorn cobs down in there with the seeds on them. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to try to germinate these. They've been in there probably 20 plus years in the bottom of a deep freeze. And I'm thinking, well, hey, I'm going to try it. What am I going to lose? And then, like I talked about the heirloom varieties, this is a Rockford cantaloupe mm. that belonged to, the seed came from my daughter-in-law's great-grandfather. Oh, this is the seed okay. from the fruit, and they've, they've kept it in the family. And this is one of the best tasting cantaloupes I that? have ever tasted. Wow. Okay. And so we do want to keep, you know, perpetuating sure. that because we just got such, such good, good flavor. Good. So... Anyway, oh, let's see what I've missed. Um, okay, you're gathering mature seed. 
like in tomatoes and watermelons and cantaloupes that are fleshy, you know, you wash the seed and dry it completely. Okay. You got to get it out of the fruit, okay. obviously. And of course, with the uh, the cantaloupe, that's fairly easy to do. You know, you just pull it, scrape it out, watermelon seed. But see, you need to wash them good and okay. get any kind of tissue that's still clinging to them as best you can off. And then I spread them usually on a, uh, like wax paper, because if you put tomato seeds on a paper towel, uh -huh. you're not going to yeah. get them off. Right. <laughs> so I use like <laughs> wax paper or just a plate, you know, like okay. a plastic plate or paper plate or something. Smart. And then spread them out and then let them completely dry. And then let them dry some more. <laughs> okay. Because the bane of storing seed is moisture. You want the moisture to be, you know, pretty much the seed totally dry. Because if you dry, I mean, if you put them in a, a moist place, the seed is not going to be viable as long. Okay. And the best place would be in a dry, dark place. And I like to use glass containers because I can tighten them down and they have a structured shape. I don't really like using the Ziploc bags because they can break open, oh, okay. you know, but can I like to, but I have a lot of seed, I kind of go that way. Sure. But, and I store my seed uh, in the refrigerator or the, refri or the freezer. Hmm. Or some of it, I just keep around the house in a box. You know? <laughs> so, as long as it's cool, dark, and dry, and dry. I think right, you'll it. be good. Cool, dark, and dry. Got it. Yeah, yeah, you know, so. <laughs> but, let's see, airtight container, okay, airtight. obviously. Uh, label, label yeah, so you your got the seed. Label. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah. you got to put the label on there because you may think you're going to remember, but I can guarantee you, you won't. <laughs> And I put the year, I put the variety, okay. you know, and then I put the year, and I even put the month, I think, on that one, yeah, September. September yeah. yeah, so, like, again, you can, you can uh, make sure that there's no moisture in there. And the way that, that I do it, you know, we get these little yeah. silica packets. Uh -huh. My little silica packets out here. So I'm going to put them right there and so we can look at those. But this, is, this came in dog food treats. This came in a shoe box, <laughs> and these came in some of my pills, okay. my pill bottles. Right. So we have a lot of these, you know, that run through the house. So I save all of those, and then I use them to put in my seed containers, you know, wow. to take the, uh, to, you know, absorb the moisture. And I read you could use something like powdered milk, but that's kind of messy. Oh, so wow. I usually just save all of these little dudes, and okay. that helps. Wow. You know, that helps kind of control the, the moisture. I would have never thought about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, recycling. Yeah. You know, think about that. Okay. You know, take care of the climate and uh, recycle. You know, yeah. throw those in the garbage, uh, you know. So, sense. yeah, you can just use them for I don't know how long, you know. <laughs> but uh, I want to mention, you know, we talk about viability of seed okay. and storage and longevity. There are lists online that list like vegetables, like beans and peas and lettuce and radish seed, and then it will tell you under good storage conditions, okay. dry, cool place, how long those seed typically can be viable. Okay. So that's a good thing to that's know. Good. You know, yeah. I mean, you've got your year on there, and you like five years from now, and it's lettuce seed, you're going, oh man, that stuff's probably no good. Yeah, anyway, it's not going to germinate. <laughs> you know, so that kind of helps you, <laughs> gives helps. you like a a range and I looked up because I thought well, you know seeds is so interesting you know you it hear is. about people discovering these old seeds and things and all the glaciers are melting and right. we got all these seeds coming up and and you thinking well what is the oldest seed that's ever successfully been germinated well I looked that up and it was a Judean date palm that was extinct more than 500 years ago and right. they found the seed in Herod's palace site on Masala. Okay. And they took those date palm seed Crazy. and they, yeah. in 2005, they successfully germinated that old extinct wow. date palm and brought it back. And it was 2000, they carbon dated, it's 2000 years old. That is, isn't that incredible? Yeah, and it was a, it wow. wasn't in a, a cold place, it was just in a very dry, dark, cool wow. place, you wow. know, whatever. So it was just great. And then the next one, that I read, there's all kind of lists, sure, of, you know, sure. but verifiable. The second one was a, an, a lotus, okay. a lotus yeah. seed nice. that they found in a dry lake bed in China. And it was 1,300 years old. 1,300 years yeah, old. Yeah, can you imagine? Incredible, incredible. Dr. Kelly, we got to wrap it up. Oh, okay, seed sorry. Seed swap. Yeah, can seed you tell swap. Us yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when you gather your seeds, you know, obviously I got like, what, <laughs> 5 million marigold <laughs> okay. seed here? So if you think, well, I don't, I, I want to, you know, you were raised to not waste anything, sure. right? Right. We, we're in that generation. Right. You don't waste. 
So you might want to just have a, sweet, uh, a seed swap with your friends. You know, just say, hey, I got like five pounds of marigold seed, and they got like 10 pounds of peas. Okay, let's swap it up. So that That's way good. you're helping each other out. You're perpetuating good things. You know, you're taking care of carrying on good species, I mean, good varieties of things. So a seed swap would seed be something to take care of a lot of stuff. Yeah, Master Gardeners so. talk about that all the time. Oh, yeah, Thank that's you, fun. Dr. Kelly, this is good yeah. stuff. Good stuff. Thank you much. Appreciate yeah, you being you're here. welcome. All right. Okay, we're in the butterfly garden, and we're going to harvest the oregano because it is a wonderful culinary herb that dries really well, holds its flavor real well, and even though it is perennial and it can maybe have some green foliage throughout the winter, right now is the good time to, to start cutting it and preserving it. So I'm gonna demonstrate how to do that. Of course, you won't get the seed pod, so you go in here. Here looks like a good bunch of green foliage. So you go in here and grab a handful and just snip it off. And the way I would do these, since the leaves are kind of tiny, stems are tiny, I find a bunch of newspaper, old newspaper, and I spread it out somewhere in a dark, cool, dry place. Sometimes that's my dining room, you know, or anywhere you have that's dark and dry. And I just spread it out on the newspaper, and it doesn't take real long for it to get dry. And then you can, you know, get the leaves off the stems, store it in a jar, or store it in one of your little fancy spice jars that maybe you're recycling. Label it and you're ready to have spaghetti sauce and lasagna and pizza and all the other wonderful dishes that oregano can be used in. All right, Joanna, so let's talk about daffodils. Yes. So we Daffodils, narcissus, uh -huh, jonquils, uh -huh. you know, they're all intertwined into the same area. Okay. Um, but they you get your most for your money when you buy a daffodil around here, especially here in the Mid-South, because they do well. They do very well. And you know, mm -hmm. one of the reasons, nothing eats them. You know, they're, they're, they are <laughs> poisonous, and that's yeah. probably why they come back so reliably, because deer, they're deer resistant, uh, voles don't eat them, uh -huh. so you know, they're poisonous, mm. so no, nothing eats them. That's good. <laughs> so that's probably why they are the most reliable in this area. Um, now, it's good to plant them this time of year. The fall is the best time to plant spring blooming flowers. Okay. And daffodils are part of that. And you're gonna say, well, there's all different kinds and we're gonna go over that as briefly as we can. Okay. Um, but uh, the depth of how you plant them, you gotta think the size of the bulbs and you want to at least plant them twice the depth that the bulb is. Twice? The yeah. Okay. So if a bulb is, is three inches tall, you wanna plant it six inches deep. Gotcha. Um, if, it, if the bulb is only two inches tall, then you only plant it, can plant it four inches deep. So, I mean, it, it just depends on the size of the daffodil bulb that you have. Okay, and this is at the bottom of the hole, right? Bottom of the hole. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and to understand some of these divisions, we're going to go over the parts of the daffodil right, flower because the, the first part you're going to need to know are the petals or the parents that surround the, the cup or the corona that's in the middle. And then on that, there's sometimes there's, they distinguish them by the color of the eyes mm -hmm. or the rim color or the size of the rim. So those are the things for identifying a daffodil that we're gonna be going over. The, the, there's this, daffodils live all over the country and England and the United States all, all have societies for yeah. daffodils. So you can, can go to those websites to get more information. But the American Daffodil Society recognizes 13 different divisions of daffodils. Okay. And the more that I have, I love daffodils, so the more <laughs> that I have known daffodils, the more of each of these divisions that I seem to have in my, at my house or, or that I've planted 13, somewhere. Mr. D, 13 divisions. That's an unlucky number. <laughs> you need to come up with another one. <laughs> well, um, there is two major uh, divisions. There are large ones and then there's a miniature category, oh. but they all are divided somewhere into these oh 13 different categories. Right. So the first division is the one that we all recognize is that is the trumpet daffodils. It's gonna have one flower per stem. The corona or the cup is gonna be as long or longer than the petals or the perianth are surrounding it. And good examples of that are the old fashioned King Alfred. And Mount Hood is another very popular one that most people have. And Marique, which is another one that looks a lot like King Alfred's. Okay. In fact, it's probably taken over as the major daffodil that is sold. Okay. Uh, Division two, 
large cupped daffodils. So it, it, as it says, again, one flower per stem. The corona or the cup is more than a third, but less than equal to the length of the petals. Wow. So examples Ooh. of that are uh, ice follies, <laughs> ferris wheel, and chroma color. Wow. And I have chroma color, and that's mine. I have some ice follies. Um, then there's a the third division are the small cupped daffodils. And that, as it says, the cup is smaller. Oh, okay. uh, but there's, again, only one flower per stem. And the, the cup is not more than a third of the length of the petals. Wow. And examples of that are Barrett Browning and Dreamlight. Now, division four is the double daffodils. And this is, these people love these. Uh, they don't t typically look like a normal daffodil okay. because they have one or more flowers per stem and they have the doubling of the parenth and or the corona or both. So it's just a full head of, of flowers. And a good example of this is Tahiti <laughs> and cheerfulness. And I have some cheerful, <laughs> cheerfulness. These are great names. Yeah, um, mm. and cheerfulness is very fragrant too. Oh, okay. uh, division five are the triandrous daffodils. Oh. Now there are two or more flowers per stem. The parenth segments are reflexed, which means they kind of point backwards. And examples of those are moonlight sensation and thalia. Thalia is one of the, it blooms really late and it's white and it's beautiful and it really does extend your daffodil season. So it's a, that's a, it's that's a favorite, one of the favorite that. ones okay. of mine. Uh, division six are the cyclamenous daffodils. Oh, wow. I get one flower per stem. The parent segments are significantly re reflexed. You know, think of a cyclamen flower. Okay. The petals go way back, and this, that's what these are, are okay, reflective of. Okay. And then the flower kind of an acute angle to the stem, so they kind of, you know, kind of drop a little bit. Next are division sevens. That's the jonquilla daffodils. They have one to five flowers per stem, and the corona or the cup is usually wider than long, and they are fragrant. And examples of these, which I have one of, is Pipette, and I, li I really like that one, uh, and Golden Echo. Division eight are the Tazetta daffodils. Now there are three to 20 flowers what? per stem. Three to 20? Three to 20 flowers what? per stem. They're very small, oh, but okay. they are very fragrant, and a good examples of those are like minnow and avalanche. Avalanche. Yeah, we think of the whole yeah, okay. stem full of avalanche of daffodils. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, division nine are the Poetica daffodils. Their parent segments are always pure white. So the petals surrounding the, the cup are very always pure white. And the corona is very short and usually rimmed in some color. Okay. Division 10 is the Bulbacomium hybrids. Wow. That's one flower per stem, but it's got a very dominant corona or cup and the, the little petals, the, the petals around it are very insignificant. So you have this huge cup and they're very small. And white petticoat and golden bells are examples of those. Division 11 is the split cup daffodils. And of course the, the, the split corona in, in, is in a single or in many whorls around the, the petals. Um, some examples of those are Drama Queen. Oh. <laughs> and you like that, Mr. B? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, <laughs> they, but they're very frilly looking daffodils. Right. They're not, they don't look like typical daffodils. Right. Division 12 are all the other daffodils, oh my cultivars goodness. that are not, they don't fall in one of the other oh. categories. And Division 13, the daffodils are listed by botanical name, and they're usually species and wild hybrids. Oh. Um, so that is all 13 different divisions all of daffodils, thir and all of them fall in some category of those. So we have lots of daffodils to choose from, so surely there will be something for everybody to enjoy. Surely, yeah. 13 divisions? Yes. Mr. D, you like daffodils? I like daffodils. I really do, and I think I'm trying to figure out a way that we could agriculturally use them <laughs> if they're resistant to deer and, oh, and right. insects Bowls, and yeah. diseases. Oh. I mean, you ever, ever had a disease on one No. That you know of? Uh -uh. And you know, I turkey hunt, and I go out in the woods, and they're out there. Uh -huh. You can tell that is one way to positively identify where a house used to be. Oh, yeah. Because That's, yeah. they're still yeah. there. The house can be yeah. long gone. The chimney can be melted down <laughs> into the ground, but the daffodils <laughs> still live. Yes. And they spread from yes. there. 
Yeah, and, that's and, why they do and, so well and, here. And, it's uh, wonderful. Just, the know, daffodils you see them do great here. Out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Wow. Those Along ditches daffodils. and stuff where people yeah. used to have plant them. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, daffodils do very well here. Obviously, so. So, any fertilizing? How do we prepare the soil for them? Any Again, the depth that you plant them is probably the most important and well drained okay. because, as you know, we planted some out here in, in the be uh, beginning when we started the bed out right. front, yeah. and they didn't live through the winter because they rotted in the ground. Uh -huh. I do so, remember. So, that's got to be a well drained area. Got to be well that's, drained. They, they just don't want to rot in the ground. That's the that's probably the worst problem with them is getting a well drained area so that they don't, you know, rot during the winter. Mm -hmm. Yes, Joel, that was good. We can tell you like daffodils. Oh, I love daffodils. We can tell that. All right, Mr. D, stay away from that drummer queen now. Yep, stay away from that no. no, I will. <laughs> I will. I'll try. All right. Thank you much. <laughs>is the time for planting, not necessarily pruning, but there are pruning tasks that you can do in the fall. And one of them would be to get rid of anything that is dead or disease. And this can of right here looks, the top leaves are dead on it. They're not producing anything and they look ugly. So we're gonna go down to where we find a nice healthy leaf that is actually producing chlorophyll to feed the root system. And we're going to cut just above it and eliminate the dead part of this plant. And we can continue to do that all around this plant, getting rid of the, the parts that are not producing chlorophyll and doing any good for us for the root system. Now it looks a lot better. All right, here's our Q&A segment, y'all ready? Yep. Yes. All right. These are great questions. Here's our first viewer email. How do I prevent bringing pests into my home on the cut <laughs> flowers from my garden? That's a good this question. This is Mundascoria good... on YouTube. So guess what? <laughs> Joellen has cut flowers and she brings them in all yeah. the time. So what do you say, Joellen? What's we, the trick? I, what, yeah, I, what do you have I, to do? I cut them and I, I first I look and see if they were on there. But then I, of course, I cut them. And then I take them and I take the stem and I just kind of bump it on my hand, other hand, and sometimes they fall out then. And so then I get a bunch and I'm going inside and if nothing's crawling out of them by then, I can, you know, I can't bump it off. But then sometimes I will actually, uh, especially th I have problems with peonies because ants love yeah. peonies. Oh, okay. yep. right. And so I will put it under water and they'll mm -hmm. come out right. when I put water on the flowers. <laughs> and then you just kind of shake it off like it was rained on it and then you put it in the vase. Yep. And you're done. And yeah, you're done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, now, now I yeah. was going to be a little bit more <laughs> energetic. Yeah, yeah. Just beat them yeah. on something. <laughs> that would not work, you know, on some of these delicate flowers. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, kind of shaking them a little bit, yeah. using a soft stream of water outside. Outside. You yeah. know, yeah. and then I read on one floor site said that if you just cut them, and then put them in a bucket of water in the shade outside, that they will, a lot of them will just leave. Oh. Yeah. You know, I'm I haven't sure. ever tried that. I'm always anxious to get them in the house, get them in right. a vase or whatever you're gonna do. Right. And ants are a problem. You know, that's usually what sticks on there that you can't get off. Right. And then they are, you know, if you could submerge them in a little bit of water with some dishwashing, to, you know, mm. detergent, a little bit, yeah, okay. you know, liquid, okay. that that will get them off as well. Okay. But I usually just do the shake and, you know, <laughs> yeah, and then wait for them to crawl around on the counter and squish them. Yeah. That's why I do I ants. <laughs> Always bringing oh in gosh. ants. Bringing in the ants. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We well, thank you for that question. Good. All right. That was good. That was good. Here's our next viewer email. What in the world is wrong with my grass? <laughs> it is black. It looks dead. Part of it is green, but looks like the black is overtaking that side too. How do you fix this? It looks awful. And this is Mona. So, Dr. Keller, we'll start with you. <laughs> Any idea? I want to tell you, Chris. What do you think that I, might be? You, know, you send me this picture by email <laughs> attachment, and I'm trying to zoom in and look at this grass, and all I see is just black. It's just and I wanted to see if they were like spores, if it was like a mole, or if it was like smut. Yeah, we could get know. close Yeah, I couldn't get close see. enough. Yeah. But I'm like, you know, it's 90% dead anyway. <laughs> So, and I feel her pain, you know, I'm like, what in the world's wrong with it? I love that. I'm thinking, well, well, whatever's wrong with it, we just need to get rid of it and put more grass there. You know, so I really don't know exactly what is going on, but it's obviously killing it. So let's just start over. It's obviously killing it. 
I wanted to know what kind of grass. I couldn't tell that either, was. Chris. That's it, a it good is, point. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. We don't know where she's from, but yeah. I know that black smut yeah. will cause your grass to look black. Yeah. Like that. It's a fungus. Uh, you usually get black smut in the spring when it's cool and in the fall when it's mm -hmm. cool, especially if you over fertilize. Uh -huh. it. Right. Yeah. So I've yeah. seen black smut in mm -hmm. the Memphis area, you know, over the years when we have, you know, the cool springs and mm -hmm. falls. Uh, but it's usually, what grass is any kind of grass? So usually? this is usually the warm season grasses mm -hmm. that I've seen. Uh -huh. yeah. Right. So your Bermudas, uh, for sure. Right. Uh, but I think that might be black smut. Yeah, that's, that's the that first is. thing I thought right. too. So culturally, yeah, yeah, soil test, don't over fertilize, you right. have to irrigate properly good, and good things like that. Good maintenance techniques, right. yeah. yeah. That's cultural what you have to do. Things. Good cultural practices. Anything yeah. you want to add to that? Yeah, um, you know, I, if she wants to redo it, she can, but uh, yeah. maybe um, just change the environment if you can and, and try not to do the fertilizing and it might be able to come back from it, but I don't know. Right. And it looked like it was totally enclosed with like pavement. It did, didn't it? Mm -hmm. it, it yeah, did. and I'm yeah. thinking, well, maybe she wants to put something else there. Yeah. You know, if the grass like didn't work or yeah. something, she can put some like ground cover, depending on where it is. Right, you know, depending on where it is. So, mm -hmm. right. but it will come back, you know, from that. But it just, it does definitely look bad. Yeah, and there's, it does. there's no fungicide uh, recommendation mm -hmm. for that. No. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's basically your cultural practices. Yeah. You know what you have to do, and uh, right. you know, just be patient. You know, yeah. it's not gonna, you know, clear it up overnight. Yeah. So you yeah, just it be looks bad. I agree with her. What yeah. in the world? What is in the world is that? <laughs> 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 All right, well, we thank you uh, for that question. <clears throat> Hope that helps you out. So, Dr. Kelly, do all that was fun. <laughs> it was, was fun. Thank yep. you much. Good. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org. And the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about anything we talked about today, including how to plant daffodils, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid South. Be safe.